Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I want to introduce you to a project that I've been working on for the last few weeks, a 6502 emulator that runs on a Raspberry Pi Pico. So, why are you building an emulator? There's so many out there, it's like reinventing the wheel. Yeah, I know, but I wanted to see if I could make one from scratch. Since I didn't want to pollute my mind, I didn't even look at any emulators or even how to make them. Also, I don't even know if there's one available for the Pico. Well, I think you're crazy. It sounds like a lot more work than just finding one. Maybe, but that's where the fun is. So, why don't you join me on my journey to build a barrel metal arm assembly 6502 emulator? I started this Raspberry Pi Pico series by interfacing the RP2040 with my home-brewed 6502 computer that uses the MOS Technologies 6502 Terminal Interface Monitor, or TIM. I first transferred data between the two at 370 bytes per second. Eventually, I increased the transfer speed to 1000 bytes per second by using PIO, but that's still dreadfully slow by today's standards. Originally, I was going to improve the interface between the Pico and the 6502, but there's only so much you can do with a microprocessor with a 1 MHz clock frequency. Plus, I wanted to share the old school programming experience with the rest of the world. So, what better way than to turn a $4 Pico into my homebrew 6502 computer from back in the day? To do that, I need a fast 6502 emulator that runs on the Pico. I really want to build one myself just to see if I can do it. As mentioned earlier, I didn't research emulators at all. This project is my vision of what an emulator should look like. Here are my overall goals for the emulator. Since it's going to run on a 125 MHz RP2040 instead of a 3.5 GHz Ryzen Threadripper, the code needs to be efficient. The memory is also limited. I'd like the emulator to fit in the lower 64 kilobytes of static RAM of the Pico, leaving the upper static RAM available for the 6502 program along with any future graphics memory. I want the emulator to fully emulate the NMOS 6502 with the potential to grow to include the 65CO2. I want to be able to communicate with the emulated program at this time by using serial communications. Future plans may include communicating by using a keyboard and video output. Let's do a quick overview of the 6502 microprocessor. The 6502 was released in 1975 by Moss Technologies and was a very inexpensive alternative to the Intel 8080 and the Motorola 6800. It was a 8-bit processor with a 16-bit address bus. As a result, it can access 64 kilobytes of memory. The 6502 has three main registers for data manipulation. The accumulator, which can perform all data manipulation functions in conjunction with the arithmetic unit, and the X and Y index registers, which can perform some data manipulation functions, but are mainly used for index addressing, instructions, and for temporary data storage. The program status register holds the carry, zero, masked interrupt, decimal mode, break, overflow, and negative flags. The 6502 has a 256 byte stack that occupies page one of the memory. This stack starts at the top of page one and works its way down as it's filled. The stack pointer register keeps track of the next empty spot on the stack for pushing data. The location of the next instruction in memory is managed by the program counter. Since the data bus is only eight bits wide, the 6502 uses two 8-bit registers to hold the address, program counter high and program counter low. There's also an internal register known informally as the address register. This is actually two 8-bit internal data buses labeled internal ADL and ADH. This register holds memory address information based on the opcode and the addressing mode. To save code, the 6502 makes use of zero-page addressing, 
where the bottom 256 bytes of memory can be addressed with just the ADL, with the ADH assumed as zero. Several of the addressing modes make use of page zero memory locations. Now for a refresher on the RP2040 static random access memory map. There are four 64 kilobyte and two 4 kilobyte sections of static RAM. I know that it doesn't make any difference because the memory is striped, but I'm going to locate the emulator in the lowest 64K of static RAM starting at 2000 hex and the 6502 memory in 64 kilobytes of static RAM starting at 2002 hex. Looking toward the future, I could locate a graphics driver program starting at 201000 hex and 6502 graphics memory at 2003000 hex. Here's a block diagram of how I envision the emulator working. Grab the next opcode from the 6502 memory. Branch to the opcode subroutine. Go to the addressing mode subroutine to get the address register. Get the operand based on the address register. Modify the accumulator, X index, and Y index based on the operand. Check and update the flags. Update the program counter and do it again. For code efficiency, I want to use the registers of the RP2040 core as much as possible. As a result, I'm going to use assembly language for the emulator so I can easily use the registers. I'm sure I could do it in C, but since I'm not an expert, I'd need to do an awful lot of study. Besides, I feel much more comfortable programming in assembly language. For efficiency, I decided to map all the 6502 registers directly to several of the RP2040 registers. As you may remember, the RP2040 Cortex-M0 Plus core uses thumb instructions, meaning that not all of the registers are available for all functions. While the low registers 0 through 7 have full functionality, high registers 8 through 12 are very limited, allowing only move, compare, add, branch indirect, and branch indirect with link. Therefore, I'll use the low Cortex-M0 Plus registers for 6502 registers where there's a need for advanced functions, and I'll use the high registers for everything else. This is my mapping. Registers 0 through 2 are used as ad hoc registers as needed. Register 3 holds the program counter, both high and low bytes. The value stored in the program counter is the 6502 true address. That is, there's no offset added for its location in the RP2040 memory map. I'll address that offset later. Register 4 contains the opcode of the instruction being executed. Register 5 contains the 6502 accumulator. Register 6 contains the 6502 processor status register. Register 7 is the address register and acts as the ADL and ADH bus. This transmits data between the different parts of the program. Registers 8 and 9 are additional ad hoc registers, but they're not used very much. Registers 10 and 11 contain the 6502 X and Y indexes, respectively. And finally, register 12 contains the 6502 stack pointer. Let's get into some details. The starting point will be the interrupt program from the Bare Metal Adventures Chapter 8. I'll replace the PIO program with the emulator program. Let's start at the beginning of the block diagram and fetch an instruction. As you know, a 6502 instruction consists of one, two, or three sequential bytes, with the first byte being the opcode and the function of any additional bytes depending on that opcode. For simplicity, I'll always grab three bytes starting at the location pointed to by the program counter. I have the start of the 6502 memory from the linker script. Then I add the program counter to the start of the 6502 memory to get the start of the 6502 instruction 
in the RP2040 world. The first byte is always the opcode and will be moved to register 4. The next two bytes will be put in the address register, register 7, with the second byte occupying the least significant byte and the third byte occupying bits 8 through 15. I may or may not use those additional bytes. I'll discard them later if not needed. Now that I have the opcode in register 4, I can branch to the appropriate instruction subroutine. Since the opcode is only 8 bits wide, I'll use the lookup table for the subroutine address. The lookup table is 256 4 byte words long. Each opcode has an associated subroutine, and its label is listed in the order in the lookup table based on the value of the opcode. For instance, the break instruction has an opcode of 0, so it's listed first in the lookup table. The next instruction, or accumulator x indirect, has an opcode of 1 and follows the break instruction. There's an entry for each possible opcode. If there is no instruction for an opcode, then an error subroutine is referenced. To access the lookup table, I'll shift register 4, which contains the 6502 opcode, left 2 bits, effectively multiplying it by 4. This is needed with the lookup table that uses 4 byte words. The start of the lookup table was provided by the linker script. Then I simply load register 1 with the address pointed to by the start of the lookup table with a register offset of the opcode. Then I branch indirect with link to that subroutine. I thought the decoding would be the tricky part, but it wound up having a fairly straightforward and elegant solution. Next, we have to actually manipulate the registers based on the opcode. I'll demonstrate the process so far by using a fairly common instruction, LDA absolute, or load the accumulator with memory using an absolute address. The opcode for this 3-byte instruction is AD. Here's the instruction in a program, and this is the hex dump of the same program after compiling. At this point, EMU start, which is the start of the 6502 memory in the RP2040 world, is 20020000 hex, and the program counter is 15D8. I'll add the start of the 6502 RAM and the program counter to get the location of the RP2040 memory. Then I'll grab three bytes at that location. The first one, which is the opcode, will go in register 4, and the second two, which is the address, will go into the address register, which is register 7. I'll use the opcode to look up the LDA absolute instruction. The start of the lookup table in the RP2040 world is lookup start and has moved into register 0. Then I'll shift R4 left 2 bits and then use R4 as an index with R0 to grab the address of the LDA absolute instruction from the lookup table. Then I'll use a branch indirect with link to branch to that subroutine. Inside the subroutine, I'll first push the link for eventual return from the subroutine. Next, I have to incorporate the address mode. As you probably know, the 6502 has 13 different address modes. They're listed here. I won't go through each one. However, each one does require a different method of calculating the address or operand. Within each of the opcode subroutines is a call to a subroutine specifically developed for that addressing mode. For instance, this routine calls the absolute addressing subroutine. Absolute addressing is fairly straightforward, where we leave the absolute address in R7 and increment the program counter by 3, since an absolute address instruction is always 3 bytes long. After the address is firmed up, we'll get the operand by calling 1 byte read. Here I use the start of the 6502 memory within the RP2040 world to get the actual address and then load R7 with the byte that's stored in that 6502 address. Next, we move the data that was in R7 into R5, which is the accumulator. But before we can exit, we need to update the flags. This instruction affects the negative and zero flags. 
So I'll call the flags NZ subroutine. First, I'll check if bit 7 is set. If so, the number is negative and I'll set the end flag or bit 7 of register 6. Then if the byte in the accumulator is 0, I'll set bit 1 or the 0 flag of register 6. After the flags have been updated, we're done with this instruction and we'll start processing the next one. That was a pretty simple example. The absolute addressing mode requires the least change to the address register. A more complicated mode is relative addressing. This mode is used for branches. These two byte instructions tell the program counter to increase or decrease by up to 127 based on the value of the second byte contingent on whether a fly condition has been met. Take the BEQ or branch of equal instruction. Here are two examples, one a forward branch and the other a negative branch. The direction of the branch is determined by whether bit 7 of the second byte is set or cleared. Here we first test the flags in R6. If bit 1, the 0 flag, is cleared, then we will not take the branch. We will just increment the program counter by 2 and get the next instruction. However, if bit 1 is set, then we will take the branch. Using the relative addressing subroutine, we will discard the third byte that was stored in register 7 when we fetched the instruction. We will increment the program counter by 2 since that's where we start counting the branch offset. Then we will test bit 7 to determine the direction of the branch. If it is set, the branch is negative, and we will subtract the offset from 100 hex and then subtract that result from the program counter. If bit 7 is cleared, the branch is positive, and we will simply add the offset to the program counter. Then we will return and fetch the next instruction using the modified program counter. Another instruction that modifies the program counter is the JMP or jump instruction. Here the second and third bytes of the instruction are simply transferred to the program counter and the next instruction fetch gets the instruction at the new program counter. The JSR or jump subroutine instruction is similar. However, before the next instruction is fetched, the high and low bytes of the address for the instruction following the JSR instruction are pushed onto the stack. Each time a byte is pushed onto the stack, register 12, the stack pointer, is decremented by 1. Conversely, when a byte is pulled from the stack, the stack pointer is incremented by 1. The subroutines 1 byte push and 1 byte pop take care of decrementing or incrementing the stack pointer and then calculating the RP2040 world address. Many of the arithmetic functions in this emulator simply rely on the equivalent functions in the RP2040. For instance, the ADC or add with carry instruction makes use of the arm add instruction. The same for and, or, exclusive or, shift left, and shift right. However, subtraction is done old school using two's complement to calculate the result. I did this to keep proper track of the carry and overflow flags. In addition, since there is no decimal mode in the ARM Cortex M0 Plus cores, I had to develop separate BCD routines for subtraction and addition. Using and modifying the X and Y indices is similar to that of the accumulator. Data is loaded into the indices and is modified as needed. The indices are also used in many addressing modes. For instance, the X indexed indirect addressing mode subroutine isolates the least significant byte in register 7 and then uses that operand added to the X index as a zero page address. Then two consecutive bytes are read from that zero page address and the result stored in register seven. This then becomes the final address for the instruction that called the addressing mode. From a high level standpoint, that's all there is. But the devil's in the details and we'll get into those details as well as loading and running a very thorough functional test program next time. Thanks for joining me today. We examined the high-level workings of an assembly language 6502 emulator that runs on the RP2040. Because I created this completely on my own, I have no idea if it's a good design or not. However, I've run fairly exhaustive tests on it, and it seems fast, compact, and accurate. I'll get into the testing phase as well as some of the sticky issues I had to deal with next time, so stay tuned. 
I'll release the code next time after I clean it up. If you like this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon.